it's a real honor to be the chairman of the first session of this um, conference. But I must uh, warn you that I'm a very bad chairman. Um, because, not only because uh, I am too s soft person to cut down uh, the speaker, but because I'm usually uh, became my, become myself interested in the subject the speaker says, uh, and uh, do not interrupt them. So I pray you help me and keep to time, to time prescribed. And the first lecture, the first talk, as you know, is by Professor Rolf Hagedorn, and with great pleasure, I call him to begin his talk. I correct you, Mr. Chairman, I'm not professor. <laughs> Here you read the story which happened to me. It was described in 1760 by Lawrence Stern in his book, The Life and Opinions of Tristram Shandy, Gentlemen. It is the nature of a hypothesis, when once a man has conceived it, that it assimilates everything to itself as proper nourishment. And from the first moment of your begetting it, it generally grows the stronger by everything you see, hear, read, or understand. This is of great use. Well, I guess that most of you know the statistical bootstrap model, but for the others, there is a little introduction. It's uh, abbreviated SBM in the whole talk, statistical model of strong interactions, which is based on observations, namely on the observation that hadrons form bound and resonant states and decay statistically into such states if they are heavy enough to decay. We call these states clusters or fireballs. In the beginning of the whole business, multiparticle production, they have been called fireballs. Now they are called clusters, but uh, that's the same as resonances. Never mind the name, we shall see what it is. Within strong interactions, if there is no gravity, uh, there is an unlimited of heavier and heavier of such clusters. And each is possibly a constituent of still heavier ones. At the same time, it is composed of lighter ones. So in a way, one can say that fireballs consist of fireballs. You see, it's driving to a requirement of self-consistency. Clusters owe their existence to strong interactions. If one introduces them as constituents, then they simulate, simulate the strong interactions due to which they exist themselves. Again, you see, it's driving to a kind of bootstrap. We need all of them, and we shall introduce a mass spectrum, which for the time being is unknown. It is a function which tells you how many different species quantum states are within the interval m and m plus dm. If we push the whole thing to the end, we arrive necessarily at the self-consistency condition, and the self-consistency condition is just the mathematical formulation of what I said before, fireballs consist of fireballs. This self-consistency condition forces this unknown mass spectrum to be an exponential function, and we shall see why. 
Oh no, we better. We, we don't see why. I will tell you that it is so, and you have to believe it. <coughs> now, if you have such a mass spectrum, which grows exponentially, and I have written it as exponential of m over t zero, then this t zero, in any thermodynamics where you have these particles as constituents, there this t zero will be a singular temperature. Below, everything is okay. If you reach this temperature, the partition function will have a singularity, and you cannot go beyond that. Now, <clears throat> the power of this model, and why it has become rather popular among experimental physicists, is that in this model, the strong interaction gas is replaced formally by an ideal gas of resonances with an exponential mass spectrum and with mass proportional volumes. The latter is in order to uh, keep track of the, uh, of the repulsive forces which uh, are replaced here by a finite volume of particles. Now this gas can be handled analytically without perturbation methods can be fully solved and therefore it's very useful and it can be handled without difficulty. Now in this lecture I shall not try to say what we have done with this model but I rather would like to uh, trace the history which starts in 1936 already with three different foundations and which very slowly diverged to this model. And I'm not in this lecture going to give a full account. That will be impossible. I only will mention those things which are on the line, on the, in the historical line, which led to this model, but nothing else of the whole time. Now, there is a very good report by Professor Feinberg, our chairman, which uh, traces this whole history, not the history of this model, but the whole history of multi-particle production is in physical, uh, Physics Reports 5, 1972. Now, the history is sketched here. There are three routes. Heisenberg, Bohr, and Weisskopf, and Beet and Uhlenbeck. Now, this line here describes how one came to the idea that fireballs, that is clusters of hadronic matter, exists. Because that was not obvious that these things do exist. Well, I was told by the operator that I should not use this thing because it's not, is it visible? Yes. Okay. In the second line, which starts with Bohr and Weisskopf, the statistical description of these objects is described. Now, you see, these two lines had nothing to do with each other. These people here developed methods which would describe these objects here without knowing that these objects would ever be discovered. And then the third line is this year, Beit Uhlenbeck and Belenki, which shows how one can incorporate strong interactions into a statistical model. And then they all love, uh, uh, come together in the CERN statistical model, and from here there is only one further step to the statistical bootstrap model, and this very important step was triggered by the discovery that large angle elastic scattering of hadrons drops exponentially with the primary energy. Okay, first question, first line. How do we know that fireballs, that is clusters of hadronic matters, do exist? The first daring 
proposal was done by Heisenberg in 1936. He said that the events which one observed in photographic plates, cosmic ray events, in which many particles came out from one point of impact, were due to the fact that many particles were produced at the same collision. Now, at that time, the only a uh, reasonable theory which was known was quantum electrodynamics without renormalization at that time. And everybody believed that many particles could not be produced in the single interaction because everybody believed that what was produced there would be electron-positron pairs. Measures were discovered 11 years later. And uh, that the cross-section would be proportional to the fine structure constant to the power 2n for the production of n particles and that would be practically zero for every n a little bit larger than 4 or 5 or so. Therefore, when Heisenberg proposed that still there would be many particles produced in one single interaction, that was a very heretical idea. The common belief at that time was you hit a nucleus and then you hit the first nuclear and the second, a third, and so on. And each time you only produce one pair. And then in the end, of course, you will see many. But that comes because the target is a heavy nucleus, a silver nucleus, for instance. Now, the next thing happened in 1954, and that is the discovery by Dulles and Walker of a particular pair of coordinates, which was very important. That was based on two things. The one is to take the transformation from the center of mass frame in which the interaction happens to the lab frame. Here you have the situation in the center of mass frame. Here you have the lab frame. And the angular distribution is transformed by tangents of theta is equal to the sine of theta prime. Prime is in the rest frame without prime is in the lab frame, divided by cos theta prime, beta, beta prime. Beta is the velocity of the object in the lab frame, and beta prime is the velocity of the emitted particle in the rest frame. Now this is a formula you see in every textbook. I will not explain it here further. And if beta and beta prime are both of order one, that is, if everything is relativistic, then this formula reduces to 1 over gamma, that's the Lorentz factor, times tangent of theta prime over 2. That's one thing. And the second is, if you look at the number of particles which an isotropically emitting center would send into the angle, the polar angle theta prime, then elementary geometry gives you that the fraction of particles is one half times one minus cosine, uh, cosine theta prime, and that's sine squared of theta prime over two. Now you have this f, which of course is an invariant in a way, because the same number of particles which goes into the angle theta prime in the rest frame will go into the angle theta in the lab frame. And then you combine these two, and you find by squaring this here, putting the gamma on the other side, gamma squared, tangens theta squared, is equal to cosine uh, sine squared over cosine squared, that is equal to f over 1 minus f. And this is, uh, and the result is, of course, that if you take the logarithm, you have log of f over 1 minus f is 2 times log gamma, which is the gamma factor of the motion plus 2 log tan theta. Now you see here you have a linear relation between log f over 1 minus f and log tan theta. And these are the two, uh, the two uh, Dulles-Walker variables. If you plot an event now in such a way that for each particle i, you define the fraction f i of particles which come in the same cone that is, which have a smaller angle, and you plot y as log of fi minus, uh, over 1 minus fi versus x, 
with this log tan theta i, then this is a straight line. And the particles will scatter around this straight line. They will do so, of course, only if the conditions, the suppositions are true, that is, the particles are relativistic, the center is moving with relativistic velocity, and the object from which the particles emitted, are emitted is emitting isotropically in its own rest frame. If that is true, then an event will be uh, will scatter around such a straight line and you can read off immediately what is the gamma factor, that is what is the velocity of the emitting object in the center of mass frame and <coughs> uh, from that you know what the energy was. Any problem? No. Okay. So that's what you should expect. Now what happens in reality is quite different. The pioneers in this business were a collaboration of Krakow and Prague and on the other side of the ocean, Kokoni. They analyzed data from cosmic ray events with this method and they found, pardon me, they did not find a straight line, but they found typically something like this. Here is a part of straight line, then shifted to the right is another part of straight line. Here, part of straight line, another part of straight line. Here, straight line, part of straight line, uh, which is shifted. And the interpretation, of course, was that you have not one center which emits particles, but you have two. And these two have different velocities. Now, Kokoni devised a two fireball model, which says two particles hit each other, two protons say, then the two protons will fly away, but there is left something behind, which are two fireballs, which move a little less fast than the two original protons, and these two fireballs will emit mesons isotropically. Now the one is going in this direction, the other in that direction, and if you transform it to the lab frame, then one will be very fast and the other will be slow. So what you expect is a cone of particles, which is very narrow, and another cone, which is very large. In the rest frame, or in the center of mass frame, that would be just two emitting centers, one moving that way, then the other that way. Now, in order to fix the situation a little better, Kokoni considers another representation in which these particles and these particles are plotted separately. And then you see the whole beauty of the method and the importance of the Dulles-Walker <coughs> variables. You see, indeed, one event has two separate straight lines. They have not always the same slope. Uh, you should not expect that they all obey exactly those conditions which I met in the beginning, which I put in the beginning. But you see, there can, it can be interpreted as having two fireballs moving with different velocities and emitting particles isotropically. So the lesson from that is, of course, fireballs do exist and they emit isotropically. There was another important thing which happened in the meantime, and that was the discovery that the transverse momenta of these emitted particles, or the energy in the rest frame, are limited. They do practically not depend on the primary energy. Now, I have here all the lessons which we have drawn or which we can draw. Lesson one was on the basis of Heisenberg's proposal. Lesson two is limited transverse momenta, very important. And lesson three, 
Secondary seem to be emitted from two fireballs, isotropically and with small p. So that is the first line of argument which leads to the existence of fireballs is this line. And now we turn to this line where we see how can these things be described. So, we jump back to 1936. In 1936, Niels Bohr proposed, in order to explain some uh, experimental facts, that uh, when a nucleus, a heavy nucleus, is hit by an energetic particle, this particle may lose all its energy and distribute it among the other nucleons. So the nucleus will be excited, but no individual nucleon in it will have enough energy to overcome the binding energy. Now if that happens, you have a metastable state, it will stay a long time, and then by statistical distribution, statistical fluctuations, every now and then a particle may have enough energy to get out. But that doesn't happen all the time, and it is a statistical process. Now, Weisskopf, in 1937, wrote an article in which he quantitatively fixed up the spectrum of particles which would be evaporated from such an excited nucleus, just a year later. The idea is this, you have a compound nucleus A, which is ec excited. It emits a neutron N and leaves behind another compound nucleus B, which still is excited. Now, in order to calculate what is a spectrum, he uses the principle of detailed balance, in which you know you have to know the level densities of the incoming state, of the, the uh, in state, of the out state, and the cross section for the inverse process. If you know these three ingredients, you can calculate from it what is the probability for evaporation. He does this, and here I have made a, a green frame around the words level densities, omega A of EA, that's the level density of the compound nucleus which emits, omega B of EB, that is the compound nucleus B which is left behind, and the word level densities is so important in our whole argument that I have made that green arrow and the green frame around. You will ever now and then see the word level density. Now you assume that the inverse process has a cross-section which is known, it's just a number, and you assume to know also these level densities. Then you can calculate the probability that a neutron of energy epsilon, d epsilon, is emitted. It's pro proportional to the cross-section of the inverse process, multiplied by the density omega b of eb, that is the level density of the nucleus which is left behind, because you have, you have all the states available, but you have to divide out the level density of the state uh, of, of nucleus A, because that's already contained in the cross-section of the inverse process. And then here is the level density of a single neutron in phase space. Now, the important thing which Weisskopf then does is he goes over to thermodynamics. He doesn't claim right away that this is a thermic process, but he tries. He says, let's introduce an entropy which is defined as the logarithm of level density. <coughs> K, uh, um, S equal K logarithm, logarithm of W, that's the Boltzmann formula, entropy is proportional to the level density, to the probability. So S of E is logarithm of omega of E, and T then is the inverse derivative of ds by dE. Now if you use these variables, then this formula turns into the following formula. W of epsilon d epsilon is proportional to epsilon times exponential of minus epsilon over T d epsilon. And that's just an evaporation formula. So this is the thing which you can derive in detail on one page of paper, and there you are, you have a thermodynamic description 
of the evaporation of neutrons from excited nuclei. Now, mind, this is the evaporation of a single nucleon, of a single neutron, which comes out every now and then from an excited nucleus. And that takes the wind out of the sails of all the people who say, oh, you can't apply statistics because there you need many, many particles. What is important is not the many particles which get out, but what is important is the large level densities of the nuclei which are involved. So whenever you have very large level densities, you may apply statistics. An immediate consequence of this approach and its success was many years later, however, that Koppe was the first to consider a nucleus as a black body which is excited by still higher energy particles and which may radiate mesons. So meson radiation could be described statistically if you assume that the nucleus which is there and which is excited, that was at the time at the Bevatron in Berkeley, when you had alpha particles of 350 MeV, that was a very high energy at the time, and correspondingly temperatures which were one-tenth of the pion mass only, but it worked. So he calculated in a model which is more or less based on the compound nucleus model and the Weisskopf evaporation, the production of mesons, and it worked rather well by order of magnitude, let's say. And Falmi, two years later, considered then, that is the important step, not the nucleus as a black body, but the uh, pion field itself as a black body radiation, and devised his statistical model. The large level density which was needed was then for Koppe, provided by the nucleus, and for Fermi by the field itself. Now, it's important to realize, or it's amusing to realize, that Fermi describes the statistical decay of a fireball eight years before the fireballs were detected by means of the Dulles-Walker variables, as I told you before. So here, the theoretical description goes much farther, much uh, faster than the experimental discovery. Now, Fermi's formula is known to everyone. It's just the phase space integral. The phase space integral is proportional to the production probability for n particles, which is, again, here you have the cross-section for n particles being in a small volume together. It's V0, kind of nucleon volume to the power n divided by V to the n. And then that is a phase space density for n particles. The V to the power n drops out, and you have the Fermi formula, which is just the phase space density in a particular, particularly small volume, V0. It's the phase space integral, it's a density, it's a probability, whatever you want. Now, the integral is not solvable, except if the masses are zero or infinity. But that is, you have the non-relativistic approximation for the energy or the relativistic. So Fermi treated mesons as massless and nucleons as non-relativistic. At his time, that was very reasonable because the limited transverse momenta, that is, limited energies, were, of course, only discovered six years later. So he said, mesons are light, they are very fast, massless. Nucleons are heavy, they are very slow. So you have energy is equal to P squared over 2M. And at high energies, he just wrote a thermodynamic formula, which comes by Laplace transformation of this one, for massless pions. Unfortunately, his model failed by uh, how much? 15. I think I, I rush up a bit. His model failed by factors of more than 10. Now, the other thing which happened at the same time is the discovery by Beth and Uhlenbeck 
this line now, that in statistical mechanics, you can quantum mechanically incorporate interaction. Now, the idea is very simple. Suppose you have an n-particle gas with masses m1 to mn at the energy E. And you have a bound state between two particles, one and two, say. Then the level density is no longer sigma n, this here. It is sigma n minus one, and the first mass is m12, that is the bound mass between the two particles. So you see, the binding changes the level density. And that's an important point, which we shall keep in mind for later. <coughs> now, they extend this argument to scattering, which is not so difficult. Single out again of n particles, particle one and particle two, put a spherical shell around them, centered at the point of impact of these two particles. Then these two particles may interact, <coughs> and the wave function will be sine pr minus l over pi half, l is the uh, angular momentum, plus eta L of P, where eta L of P is the phase shift which is induced by the scattering. <coughs> now the boundary condition is that this wave function should vanish at capital R, which is the, in, the uh, normalization volume. And that is possible only if the sign vanishes, so PR minus L pi over 2 plus eta L of P must be n times pi, where n is 0, 1, 2, and so on, and so on. Now this n then labels the discrete quantum states Pn, which are allowed between these two particles. And the level density of this two-particle uh, two system at a certain momentum p prime will be dn by b dp prime because up to n there are just n such states dn by dp prime r over equal r over pi plus one over pi d eta l of p prime by dp so the interaction between the particles one and two will introduce the derivative of the phase shift at the place p prime now, this idea was later used by Belenki in order to introduce interaction in statistical models. Suppose that this interaction here has a resonance at a certain P, pri P star. Now, it's known that the phase shift at the resonance rises suddenly by pi. So the interaction, uh, the, the uh, derivative of this uh, interaction phase shift at this place will be a delta function, almost a delta function. For us, it's good enough. And introducing then a delta function in the density of states as an additional part in the density of states is completely equivalent to introduce the corresponding mass of these two particles as a new mass as an independent particle, just as if, as if it were a bound state. So the lesson is, if you wish to introduce interaction in such a statistical model, use bound states and resonances as if they were individual new particles. They will simulate the interaction which happens in this gas. Of course, you have to repeat this argument for all particle pairs, for all partial waves, and so on and so on. I don't wish to uh, confront you with this because it's a little bit complicated. Now I come to the CERN statistical model. I have still how much? I should end. When should I end? That's the best. 1315. No, no. 1415. 15. 15. Okay, 10 minutes. Right. So, in 1957, the CERN PS was near uh, completion. Construction had started in 54. And the experimenters wanted to know 
what happens if I shoot the beam on a target? How many particles will go into that and that direction and what kind of particles? So we had to calculate what are the secondary beams. The only available model at that time was the Fermi statistical model, which I uh, just described. And so uh, Franz Cerulus and myself were asked by our division leader, uh, Bruno Foretti, to do just a fortnight of easy work with a Fermi model uh, so that the experimenters had something in hand. However, we realized immediately we had that uh, it was impossible because pions are not relativistic and nucleons are not non-relativistic. And that's just because of the limited transverse momenta or of the limited energies in the center of mass system of the decaying fireball. The energy there is of the order of a few hundred MeV, which is too little to, for pions to be relativistic and is too much for nucleons to be non-relativistic. And in that case, you can't evaluate the integrals, which are then uh, calculated if you use this uh, approximation with a completely unknown error. Secondly, interaction between particles was important. Now, the second point had, of course, been settled by Belenki, who says, oh, just take the resonances, put them in as particles, and that settles the question. Point one, you see, a 10-dimensional, or let's say, uh, 10 particles, that is 60-dimensional integral, or let's say 30 dimension, because the space uh, dimension is not important, 30 dimensional integral, it's not so easy to do exactly, even on a computer. So Cerulus proposed we do, should do it by a Monte Carlo method, which at that time was not known to physicists. He was uh, one of the rare persons who ever had heard of it. And we sat down to work it out. It was not a usual method, but it's still in use. <coughs> as you know. Uh, it was also not so easy to work it out because we had no computer at CERN. And working out such a method for a computer which is not there is not so trivial. Anyway, we did it with the help of the Institute of Applied Mathematics in Darmstadt in Germany. And we realized that uh, phase-based integrals up to 15 particles could be done in one half to two hours, which at that time was a very, very fast uh, thing. Today it's fractions of seconds only. Uh, was a prescribable statistical error. So it's not a systematic error which is unknown, it's a statistical error which you have in hand and you do the calculation as long as the prescribed error is reached and then you say here is the integral, its precision is 10%. So that was a very important step. And I was naive enough to volunteer to write a program. Now imagine, you write a program on a computer which is not there, you write that program in machine code, which consists only of numbers. There was no Fortran, no mathematical symbols, nothing of that. And you cannot test any of your subroutines which you have written. All your subprograms are hanging in the air. You put them together and you believe you are ready. Then you go to a computer which has already been delivered, that was in Saclay. I tested the program there and it failed beyond any expectation. Now, you can imagine how it was. Whoever has written the program knows that one makes mistakes, but writing a program which consists only of numbers, a simple addition took four lines of code, you see. Uh, it's, it, it was a mess. And then everything was on paper tape, punched paper tape, teletype tape, no magnetic. Anyway, Finally, it was done, it was corrected, and we had the possibility to do the calculations. And these calculations yielded many kilometers of tape with hundreds of phase space integrals, momentum spectra, and all that. Now, it was not possible to calculate angular distributions, so the experimental physicists again had to wait for more progress. Charge distribution 
had been done correctly due to a method by Cerulus. The resonances, according to Belenki, were important. And we had one very important result, and that was that the model gave constant kinetic energies for the particles which were admitted. Constant kinetic energies independent of the kind of particle and independent of the primary energy. And we believed it was due to taking into account so many particles, 80, about 80 different species, if you count also spin, isospin, and so on. And but we could not prove it because it might have been also because we did exact phase-based calculations. Now the way was open to the final and decisive step, that is large angle scattering. It had become known gradually in 1964 that elastic scattering at 90 degrees, proton, proton for instance, would have a cross-section which dropped exponentially with the center of mass energy, and that over many, many orders of magnitude. I give you here the so-called Uriah plot, which shows this here. It goes over seven or eight orders of magnitude. It's an absolutely formidable straight line. Now, it's, of course, very tempting to interpret this exponential drop as a Boltzmann func function. And then one would say the temperature is 0.158 GeV. OK. But why? Now, Larry Jones came one day to me and asked me, say, you have done statistical model calculations. <coughs> uh, do you still remember? Can you, can you tell me what is the two-body cross-section? And for a reason which I still don't know today, we had archived all our kilometers of tape. Well, it was, had been transcribed by hand on paper. Uh, we had archived all our results, and within a week or so, we could analyze these results once more, and we found the following. We looked at the two-body phase space and divided it by the sum over all phase space integrals at a given energy. And the result was striking. We found it's proportional to exponential minus 3.17e, where energy is measured in GeV. Now, if you say that e is twice the transverse momentum, <coughs> you can neglect the mass, at 90 degrees, the two p's make the total energy. You see, it gives constant, here it is, exponential minus pt over one, uh, 0.158, which is exactly that number. Now, mind, we had no free parameters at that time. We, we just went uh, to, the, to the box and, and got out our old numbers. We calculated these ratios from the numbers, and we found this result, which exactly agreed. Now, I was immediately convinced that there was something very deep behind it, and uh, I think I was the only one who was convinced of that, except one man, Cocconi. I would, like, would have liked to, to pay him now the necessary credit for that, but he is not there, unfortunately. Now, <clears throat> it had to be proved that it was an exponential behavior, had to be proved beyond this simple numerical coincidence, which proves, after all, nothing. And at the same time, there was also a paper by Biawas and Weisskopf, uh, which uh, treated the whole thing with a terminal model and in which they used a massless pion gas and found uh, a, a, yeah, a massless pion gas as, uh, the, for, for all the other channels. And they found a very reasonable agreement with the data, but not an exponential. They found exponential of energy to the three quarters, as you should expect from a massless gas. Now, there we were, and we had no proof. 
The question was then, is it really exponential or is it not? Our result was then that the sum over all phase space integrals, which was in the denominator, two minutes, where to divide the two body phase space by all the phase space integrals, the number of the, the sum of all phase space integrals was an exponential of an energy. And if our result was really true, then that would mean that fireballs up to 8 GeV, that was the highest energy in elastic scattering, would exist and they would have an exponential spectrum. And since the logarithm is the, uh, is the since the entropy is the logarithm of the density of states, the entropy would be a constant times the energy, and the temperature would be constant, which again would explain the constant transverse momenta. Now, Cocconi was the first and the only one who agreed with this point of view, and he uh, wrote this in an article which I cannot go into. We had now all the ingredients to construct the model with the last things were the exponential decrease, which was described by the statistical model, which contained resonances and correct phase space integrals. And we had to try to make a model which did all that. Now, I skip a few formulae and come to the construction of the bootstrap. If anything deserved the name fireball, then it was that lump of hadronic matter which could, among many, many other possibilities, decay into a two-body final state with an exponential decrease of the cross section. That had been observed, and that had to be taken for granted. So that, in a way, for us, or for me, uh, proved that a fireball exists and has an exponential spectrum, at least up to 8 GeV. This fireball is correctly described by the thermal model. We postulate, therefore, that these fireballs exist. Fine. Now we remember that we have two sorts of mass spectra. I had to skip this transparency. We have one mass spectrum, which is rho of m, the density of states of the constituents of the decaying fireball, that is, the number of resonance states which go into the description of a big fireball. And secondly, we have the density of states of the fireball itself, two densities of states. The one I call sigma of m for the fireball and the one rho of m for the constituents. Both are density of states, both count numbers of different species of quantum states in a certain interval. Now, a review, if you look at the review of particle properties, then you see that in the, under the heading partial decay modes, that heavy resonances decay into particles and lighter resonances. So they do not directly decay into pions, they decay into resonances. In other words, heavy resonances consist of particles and lighter resonances. Therefore, there is no difference between resonances and particles, and therefore there should be no difference, no essential difference between these two sorts of densities of states. Namely, if there is no principal difference between resonances and fireballs, resonances, the constituents, fireballs, the objects to describe, then the states which are counted in sigma of m, the states counted in the density of states of the big object, must be admitted as possible constituents of still bigger fireballs. In other words, the two function, rho of m, and sigma of m, and you have to put v0, v0, because it's restricted to fireballs of this order, count essentially the same thing. Essentially, that means there might be differences. At very low energies, of course, there will be differences. In order to keep the door open for small differences, uh, algebraic factors or so, 
the requirement was then that these two functions should be logarithmically equal. The entropy should be the same. In other words, logarithm of sigma of m at v0 of a logarithm of rho of m at the same m should, for large m, go to 1. Now, that was a self-consistency condition which expressed only that there is no principal difference between the constituent resonances and the fireballs, which could be constituents at a higher level. Now, the rest is mathematics. If you put this condition, then you find that I will be finishing. You find that the only way to satisfy this condition is that both functions, rho and sigma, have to grow exponentially. This constant is left open. It can be found from other reasonings. That it must be exponential, you can see by iteration. If you take for rho of m, simply a delta function. The only sort of particles admitted is a pion, so a delta function at the pion mass. Then you find that sigma is already exponential of m to the three quarters. That is a function which grows already almost exponentially. This is just the massless pion gas. Now, then you take this sigma as a new rho and you iterate again then you find that the new sigma should be an exponential of energy divided by the logarithm of the energy, which is still nearer to the exponential. And if you go on that way, you see you cannot overshoot the exponential, so it must be exponential. But of course, one can prove it in many other ways. Now, given the asymptotic rho of m, one can complete it by adding explicitly the low-lying masses, calculate z, the partition function, and from z, the rest. T0 is a singular temperature, and the nature of the singularity depends, of course, on details. And one of the big steps which was made later and which used the methods which were proposed by Stephen Frauci was to introduce into this model finite volumes for the particles, and if you do that, then this T0 is still a singular temperature, but it's not an ultimate temperature, that is, you can reach this temperature at a finite energy density. So, after all, SPM is a self-consistent scheme in which the particles, call them clusters or resonances or fireballs, are simultaneously three things. They are the object of the description, they are the constituents of this object, and they generate the interaction which keeps the object together. In other words, fireballs consist of fireballs which consist of fireballs and so on. So I have started the lecture by a quotation from my beloved author, Lawrence Stern, and I finish it with another quotation. Thank you. Maybe I should even renounce on the doctor. <laughs> uh, is there any questions or remarks? No. We have still five minutes. Uh, you want to say? Yeah, yeah. please. Uh, 
I found it very interesting to see how the early development here was inspired by the nuclear statistical theory of Weisskopf and so on. But it seems to me that there were there are some differences that and also similarities in development that you did not at all emphasize. The first one of this is that the statistical nuclear model, in fact, as a routine, I would say, includes the idea that there are decaying resonances not in the outgoing neutron, as Weisskopf had it, but for the nucleus state behind. Those states are not sharp states, they are broad states, decaying states. So the entire problem of Belenke and Beethoven Ullenbeck in fact was routinely used very early in nuclear physics and incorporated and never caused any particular problem. So that was already there, but seems not to have been noticed on the particle side. It was just uh, yeah, I, up as a separate I haven't, no, I haven't uh, mentioned it because I didn't know. I, I read the paper by Weisskopf very carefully, and he doesn't mention this. No, it's not mentioned. It was used in nuclear physics in a way in the 40s and 50s under conditions which obviously to the people who used it were overlapping states. But since it was a statistical model, was not supposed to be that precise in a way. It was glossed over, but it was uh, in practice pragmatically used very much under those mm. circumstances. I may add another remark to that. Uh, of course, I have described here the thing as if one had only sharp resonances, which uh, give uh, by derivative a delta function. Now, that's of course not true. But the point is that when by any such sort of argument you get once an exponential function for something, which we do for the mass spectrum, then it's almost impossible to get rid of it afterwards. You may then afterwards say, well, they are not sharp, these resonances, they are smoothed out. Let us here in Tunzi have used a smoothing out procedure in order to calculate from the resonances what is the beginning of the mass spectrum and find out what is T0. So you smooth it out and, and what not. But that doesn't matter. You have a mass spectrum, which is a continuous function, which grows exponentially whether the conditions from which you, or the original idea from which you calculated it is a sharp resonance or a smooth resonance doesn't matter very much. Once you get an exponential function, try to kill it, you can't. My second remark here was that on the nuclear side, there is a very definitive and sharp difference between the idea of statistical and the very rapid nearly exponential increase of level densities. In fact, there was very early, highly successful descriptions in nuclei of statistical decays, of statistical theories, which was this house of Feshbach descriptions, which were very good. And there, the very important point is that you throw out interference terms. This is something you did not mention, and that's a very central issue in the whole application of that statistical and if that thing breaks down, which it often does under circumstances, you do not have it. So the statistical model from this point of view is an extremist model. And inside of its assumptions, it's very good. But there are very specific assumptions going into this. And the exponential increase is something that comes in addition associated with the degrees of freedom and the level density. Mm -hmm. Those are two highly separate assumptions. Uh, by the way, the... Yeah, okay. Uh, you want to start again? Yes. Uh, well, it works? It works? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, well, I don't know. It's a sad remark, really. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned that uh, one element which played a big role in, is, in your work was this uh, Aurier feat. Well, I mean, to which this quotation applies, in fact. I mean, I myself was very impressed by this fit over 10 decades of the, that you have this uh, fixed angle cross-section decreasing exponentially. And uh, in fact, uh, with Frank Serulus, we showed even that this is very close to the fastest decrease you can get from, uh, if you assume Mandelstam representation, which now we do not know if Mandelstam representation 
pronunciation is right or not. But, but now, I mean, this oil field has completely gone away. I mean, if you, if you go to higher energies, it looks as if the fixed angle cross-section decreases like some power of the energy. And, uh, I mean, this is actually uh, explained by the work of uh, the quark counting rules of uh, Brodsky, Lepage, and Dennis Farah, etc. So, it's all very strange that experiments seem to indicate this exponential decrease very, very strongly, and it has all gone away at higher energies. Well, uh we, we had the good luck to, to do all these considerations at a time where it was certainly <laughs> <laughs> uh, Now, I'm speaking cloudy now. Oh, no, it's not good. It's working. It's working. Okay. I uh, want to say a few words. Um, not as a chairman, but as, uh, as uh, one of the participants. I'm old enough to be a direct witness of the whole history since 1936. Um, no doubt, Heisberg's work was remarkable by one point. He considered electrodynamic phenomenon. There was, there still did not exist the Baba Heitler uh, gas cut uh, uh, theory of showers, electrodynamic showers. And <clears throat> trying to explain it, um, Heisenberg used the theory of weak interactions by Konopitz, uh, Ullen, Konopitz and Ullenberg, which was for two years very popular but was wrong and was left uh, forgotten. According to was forgotten the, this work by Heisberg, I uh, restored this memory many times because there was for the first time said that when there is a multiple production, the particles proceed interacting uh, and cooling down until they decay into 